Welcome. We are in um, extraordinary times, and so the reason I'm sitting here presenting as if I'm a presenter is because we all have to have our voices heard. Uh, Blanche, who's much better at this than I am, is going to step in later when we do the question and answer session. But how we're going to do this is that once a week, I'll be hosting a conversation with an expert. And because we must trust the experts. Part of the problem of misinformation is that we're taking advice from people who are maybe our bosses, maybe they are wealthy, maybe we trust their views, maybe they're great business people. But to be honest, right now in this pandemic, the only people we should be listening to are experts. So I'm going to do a quick introduction of uh, Dr. Brevet, but he has to speak for himself. Uh, but where I want to do the introduction is I want to explain where I know Dr. Brouvert from. Mm -hmm. um, my father has a, um, a condition which requires Dr. Brouvert's assistance. Mm -hmm. And to our horror, um, and it was a lung condition, to our horror, my father contracted COVID in, when was that, October? Yeah, yeah. October, October last, last year. year yeah. And it was very serious because his lungs weren't in a good condition. Um, and Dr. Brouvet and I spent some time, and I'll tell it publicly, Dr. Brouvet's mm. bedside manner um, is yeah. top class. Um, <laughs> I was very anxious. I was very <laughs> panicky. My mother also had COVID. They were literally lying next to each other in hospital. Um, I, would, I, would, I would cry at home because I didn't want the people around me to see that I'm stressed. I didn't want my family members to see I'm stressed. And I'd be strong when I go out because I need to give everybody else hope. But in my view, um, I didn't think that my parents were going to make it, both of them. And that anxiety has never actually left me. And I think mm -hmm. the, the professionalism of the healthcare workers who were dealing with them, which included Dr. Brouvet, um, I actually sent them packages later yeah. because I feel they saved my parents' lives. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this thing that um, we're using Dr. Bouvet for whatever weird reason people are talking about, he's actually available to anybody who their doctors refer him mm. to. But Dr. Bouvet is the expert, and I think if we're going to manage this program, Dr. Bouvet will spend 70% of the time speaking. I will answer questions only for 30%. Because my view during a pandemic is not important. The expert view is. So, Dr. Yeah. Bouvier, I'd like you to really ground this interview okay. by you giving us just background of who you are, what your specialty okay. is, and what your average day looks like sure, um, yeah. in a covered ward. Yeah, th thank, thank you for having me, and thank you for the opportunity and the kind words. I, I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so, I, I'm a Namibian. I, I was born in Vintuk um, and then went to school in South Africa and started training medicine at the University of Stellenbosch. Um, and then did first internal medicine to become a specialist physician and then further my training as a subspecialist in pulmonology, so becoming a lung specialist. And then since I've, I came back to Namibia um, after qualification in 2014 and since then I've been working in basically ICU medicine, in intensive care medicine and lung, lung health basically. Um, up until the pand pand pandemic, I mean I never thought Training as a lung specialist, I would work in a in a worldwide pandemic of a disease mostly affecting the lungs. Yeah. So it it came as a bit of a rude awakening um, last year when things started going going wrong. But we've learned a lot. We've come a long way, um, and and it's yeah, it's been a steep learning curve, I think, for everybody in the world. Um, just on your question as to wh how my day looks, currently we we in a real peak of, of this pandemic. Um, so I start my ward rounds more or less 7.30 in the mornings and then start first seeing the non-COVID patients um, to try and protect them. And then we go on to seeing the COVID patients. Ward rounds takes me till about 12 in the afternoon. Then I have to go across to my practice, see um, the normal respiratory conditions, the things that we can't postpone. Um, and then that lasts about till three in the afternoon and then I'm back in the hospital, um, again, doing the ICU patients, the new admissions. Um, and obviously in between, if there's an emergency case, then we have to, we have to manage them. Usually till about seven in the evenings, 6.37, 7, 
we finish or I finish and then home, but obviously still the whole time at new admissions, emergencies, those type of things we, we, we manage. Okay. Yeah. So Dr. Bovey, as I said yesterday on social media, is the um, doctor who was a part of the team who supervised our health mm. when we contracted um, COVID. And I know that a lot of you have been asking, and that's um, one of the reasons that we actually formulated this in such a hurry. There was a question yesterday to me on my Twitter account where somebody said, First Lady, what is it that you and President used in order to recover so quickly? Mm -hmm. um, and some people were speculating that we used ivermectin. Mm -hmm. um, others speculate that there's some kind of cure that is being accessible by only some people mm -hmm. in society. And others are, are, are saying, we also want to be able to provide that treatment to our loved ones yeah. who are sick. Yeah. And, and I, I, I felt that's a, it's a fair question. Mm -hmm. I think many people aren't obligated to speak about their treatment or what they yeah. used, but I think we are obligated uh, to yeah. be transparent about these type of things. Um, but I think, I, and, and I'm not an expert and I want you to yeah. say it, but, but I don't, there, there is no cure to COVID. Mm -hmm. There's different treatments for different people. Yeah. We were recommended by the doctors to use a certain treatment that Dr. Bouvet will go through because I'm not qualified uh, to speak to what medication does what. He's qualified. He knows the medication that we used. All I know is that we were recommended to go on a certain course of treatment. Um, we both wanted to know more information. We went to do our own research. We actually even got a second opinion. Um, and, and, and the message I want to really get across is we must all take responsibility for what we agree to as an appropriate treatment. If Blanche goes on a certain treatment, it doesn't mean it's going to work for Monica. If it works for Monica, it doesn't mean it's going to work for Vili. So each one of us need to really have informed decisions about which treatment we use. So, so I do really, I mean, you treated us from the, from the get-go, yeah. so maybe you can just go through what happened yeah, there. Sure. So, yeah, to, to start off, I mean, we, we've got sort of standard treatment that we give, which includes basic vitamins, some anticoagulants, um, and some an basic anti-inflammatory antibiotics. So that was the initial treatment that we... that Let we. Okay. What anticoagulant is? Okay, the blood thinners, basically. Yeah. So it's, uh, um, in this case, it's aspirin, disprin, basically, uh, just mm -hmm. a specific disprin that we use to, to thin the blood, and that is purely because coronavirus has a tendency to cause um, increased blood clot formation. So we tend to put patients on, on that as a standard course of treatment. And then as to the specific treatment you were alluding to, it's it's a drug called Remdesivir. Um, and we decided to, based on uh, basic, based on health profile and the clinical condition at the time, um, I decided, and along with some other experts, that we would recommend that to um, the First Lady and the President as part of their treatment protocol. And as, as, as First Lady mentioned, they, they took the information and evaluated it. They did not consent to it initially. Um, mm -hmm. Went And, and I, I, I fully appreciate it. I think it's a very important aspect that one... In, in medicine in general, one should not just take the doctor's word. You must hear what the doctor says, but go and do your own research on that and come back to the doctor and say, yes, I agree with, with the treatment. So informed consent, I think. So what, what remdesivir is, it's not a special treatment. It's been available in Namibia since August, basically August last year. And we've been using it um, in private setting and in the state health case. So it's available in state hospitals. Absolutely, it's available in state. Um, with with this current um, sort of peak of cases, we are running low on stock, but we, it is still available. Um, and hopefully, the suppliers will be able to get in more stock soon. We we um, under immense pressure from various, or basically all our drugs are running low on supply, but it is available to to pretty much every, everybody who requires it. Um, and again, I think the important thing is not everybody will benefit from it. Um, that's that's the, the other aspect. It's not a drug that we can, it's an intravenous medication, so it's not a tablet that we can give you to drink. Um, that brings complications because it means you have to be in hospital or at a healthcare facility to to obtain it. Um, but it's 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 a drug that um, 
in in certain cases may may benefit, and I think that's why we took the the decision to treat you with it, and I'm glad we did. Um, the drug specifically, it's a antiviral drug. It was actually developed initially for the treatment of Ebola, um, and then repurposed with the outbreak of of um, SARS coronavirus. Um, and in certain cases, it makes it makes a difference. It helps people recover quicker, um, and that's that's the that's the aim we have. Um, as to your question with regards to the ivermectin, I can clearly say we did not use ivermectin at all. Um, it's not a thing that I would support in any way. I don't think there's evidence for using ivermectin, and I would not have have prescribed it for. For the treatment, I don't prescribe it for any of my patients at Do, all. Dr. Prevet, maybe tell us why. Because I, when we fell sick, we got so many messages, which we're, which we're so grateful for. Yeah. Um, and so many people, on, even on social media, even some of our friends, texted us to say, I've used ivermectin. Um, or people on social media will say, yeah. use this ivermectin. It's really effective. Where does that perception come from? So... Ivermectin in a in in a lab setting, it's got anti it's it's an antiparasitic drug, so for parasites, scabies, and those type of diseases. Um, and as with the new pandemic, scientists tried basically everything we have, throwing it at the virus in the lab, seeing which drugs can kill it. And that's where the initial thought of using hydroxychloroquine at mm. the onset of this disease came from. But what happens is you, you get exposed for, or they try, say, hydroxychloroquine, and then it has to go into studies, and they have to st start studying the outcome. Does hydroxychloroquine work at a dose where it's safe for, for, um, for human consumption, and is it actually effective in then treating the disease? And in the case of hydroxychloroquine, it went through the trials. There were some initial trials that said maybe some benefit, but it was poorly designed, very small trials. And ultimately, the, when the bigger trials came through, it, it showed no benefit, um, and hydroxychloroquine sort of okay. fell away. Um, and pretty much the same has happened with, with ivermectin. Ivermectin is a drug that in the, in the lab can kill um, coronavirus at very high concentrations, mm -hmm. not at the concentrations that it's been used to treat um, parasitic infections. Um, and there were some small trials, again, um, trials which we, we grade the quality of the trials, and they're really not good quality level of evidence um, in, in medical science. But they showed potential benefit, and I think that's where the, where the story came from, that it got onto the social media, and from there it spread like a wildfire. And unfortunately, the, the, that triggered sort of a lot of people advocating for the use. I mean, in South Africa, there was this well-known high court um, ruling that said the South African doctors can prescribe it. But that obviously then triggered research into it. So in South Africa, if a doctor wants to prescribe it, you have to enroll into a mm -hmm. trial. You, he can prescribe it then, or he or she, and you can use it and they have to report back on the on the data that data is being evaluated but but there are many other trials and the bigger trials currently um the the latest evidence if you do a cochrane review of the s trials that's that's proven benefit where they what do what we call randomized double blind placebo controlled trials where the researchers doesn't know which group the patient falls in he doesn't know if he gives ivermectin or a placebo those trials show no benefit for for in using ivermectin either as prevention or as cure. Prevention, it's very difficult to, to determine because you have to treat so many people to have a, a potential benefit because you don't know when that person will be exposed. In, so you have to, that, that takes long. So the trials for that won't, won't be out soon. Um, but, but again, the, the initial data is really not, not supportive of it. Um, what, is, what is a concern for me with regards to the ivermectin at the moment is a lot of people use it. And because it's not been studied, um, it we we don't actually know the side effect profile at at the doses that it comes in. And I've had cases where, and again, I mean, talk, talking about individual cases surviving or not surviving is it it doesn't really give us evidence. But it is concerning to me that I'm worried about drug interactions with patients using ivermectin because I've had patients come to me saying that they've used ivermectin and then they get cardiac arrhythmias or heart issues um, and they get kidney issues and liver issues which 
which I typically do not see in this um, in this similar setting. So I don't know if it's ivermectin causing it, but it's a concern because it hasn't been studied. We don't doubly sure that everybody so many people who are unconvinced yeah. I've had many people say no but I have a friend who you who says no but I've seen research and it, it really is effective and you guys yeah. must use it and in Zimbabwe it Um, of that group, me and my fellow fellow physicians that that work in with the COVID currently, um, none of us are actually supportive of the idea um, because we we just don't see the benefit. Um, and it's at, as I said, I've also spoken to my colleagues in South Africa, and they also not supportive of it. They say that that doesn't make a difference to to the the patients, and there they are allowed to prescribe it. I mean, it, as we know, the High Court said. So they, the, the, I just don't have any support um, from experience, research, or my colleagues um, that work with COVID on a day to day day basis to actually recommend okay. it. And, and, and to me, it's, it's neither here nor there. To me, it's about people needing to make informed decisions, um, doing credible research, um, and making decisions that impact their lives. Yeah. But my personal view is, no matter what I believe in, I don't believe I have a right to tell other people, use either medicine or don't use it. Give people the information, let them make their decision, um, and mindful of their conditions. And I'm not qualified, you are qualified, to say don't use it or use it. I'm not qualified and I see a lot of the people pushing are as unqualified as I am. We have nowhere near your experience. Yeah, that, that is a big problem for us. But again, I, as I said initially, I, I think patients should, should do the research and they should come to me with the questions and I can answer their questions. I mean, um, again, I, it's not a thing that I would support, but I, if, if patients come to me and say this is the reason why they want to take it, um, I will explain to them the reasons why I think it's, it's not going to be helpful and I can show them the data of the, of the studies and I can show them where the problems came about even with the, the, the registration of the drug in South Africa, for instance. Um, and I can actually show them the countries where it hasn't, where it's been used, yeah. where it's made no effect. Yeah. So I, I, those, those data is available. You must just go and look for it you at the right places. And then I think the last thing we're going to talk about before we open up the question and answer session, another question I get asked a lot is um, why are you encouraging people to vaccinate when you yourself are not vaccinated? Um, and I think there's, there's, there's a part to it that I can and I will speak to as to why um, we weren't vaccinated. But there's a part of vaccinations that I, I'd really like you to, to assist me with because I don't want to give medical advice that I'm not qualified to give. So let's let, let's talk about my involvement in in your um, lack of vaccination, if one wants to call it that. Um, I can't re really remember the date, but it was more or less a time when when the vaccines came into okay. Namibia. Yeah. Um, I was asked whether what type of vaccine I would recommend for the for the president, and um, me and a few doctors made a recommendation based on on he, the health information that we had from him and the available the current at that time current data with regards to um, vaccine safety and vaccine eligibility, if one wants to call it that. We made a recommendation of what we thought was the best at the time. Um, and um, and the, my understanding was that the plan was to get that specific vaccine. And unfortunately, there were some delays to that. And it basically ended up not having, um, not getting to a point where we could actually vaccinate the, 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 the president. Um, we... Um, having the benefit of hindsight and current information, I would probably have made a different recommendation at the time. Um, but 
but still, um, I think, and I, I, my understanding is that it was sort of part of the plan. And then, unfortunately, um, you both got got coronavirus, and that sort of put the vaccination plan a bit on hold. Um, but I, at the moment, I would still recommend vaccinating um, after after a period of time. Um, when, when, how long should we wait before we vaccinate? Yeah, so the, the, the minimum time differs. The, the British guidelines currently say four weeks. There are some guidelines that say you can vaccinate after two weeks, but definitely before three months. That would be the ideal because we know your your immunity natural immunity lasts for at least a minimum of three months. Um, we we know probably a bit longer than that, but if you really want to be safe, we would like to have you fully vaccinated at least within three months after after having your your um, COVID infection. Three months after? Yeah, within that three-month period, we would like months. to. Yeah. So, we, so, so I'll tell you what our plan yeah. is, and you can tell me whether it's the right plan or not. Yeah. Um, our plan is to vaccinate, I think it's on the 29th of June, um, and I know that they've calculated yeah. just a couple of weeks afterwards. Yeah, so 29th of June would probably, I mean, that's, that's probably about four weeks after, after you, you've, you've cleared your, your infection. So that would be fully acceptable. Yeah. And then it will give us enough time to finish your vaccine course yeah. within the three-month period if one wants to be really safe about it. So. Yeah, because the, the way, I mean, we talked about vaccine the whole time as well before we contracted yeah. COVID. And, and I think it's important for me to let people know yeah. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Um, I've done my own research. President has done his own research. Neither of us have an anti-vax uh, philosophy. Yeah. We wanted to get vaccinated. Yeah. But where I must uh, be transparent is President was advised, as, as, as you know, um, t because of his own conditions, which I'm not going to talk about. Yeah. I, I don't think that's fair on anybody. Yeah. There yeah. are people who can't use some of the current vaccines. It's a small Absolutely. number of people, but they exist. And, and he's one of them. Yeah. Um, there is a form that even if you go to get vaccinated, yeah. where you have to answer some of those questions, and some of those questions um, are a bit hard for him because of his particular yeah. issue. And I thought, let me wait until he gets his vaccine and I'll get that vaccine. And you yeah. spoke about yeah. the benefit of hindsight. Yeah. If I have to look in hindsight, I should have vaccinated earlier. Yeah. Um, and the reason I feel I should have vaccinated earlier, you treated us, strangely enough, I had a worse reaction to COVID than he did. Yeah. And he was the one that we were all stressed about, yeah. um, which is a reminder that COVID acts differently in different people. So somebody who we believed was very high risk yeah. is the one who came out better than me, yeah. who we felt there was no risk for me at all. So, so I, I, I remember once, I think it was Dr. Forchi, who said, don't let... Um, Perfect, get in the way of good enough. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good, very good expression. Yeah. Um, and and I think currently the 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 available vaccines that we have are are very effective, oh, and enough, yes. and we should should use them um, to to try and yeah you know, get the as many people as possible vaccinated, yeah. because ultimately the vaccines is the thing that's going to get us out of trouble. Absolutely. So I think Blanche is now getting the questions ready. But before Blanche um, starts with a question. Um, Dr. Brevet and I have been speaking for many times and, and I remember clearly you said in um, when he was treating my dad he said to me around November that Monica we're going to go into our second wave now but I'm not worried about the second wave I'm worried about the third wave and if we're not going to change anything that third wave is going to hit us around May and you were spot on the third wave started in May so now I'm assuming you worrying about the fourth wave. Absolutely. I, Wh I when mean, would you say the fourth wave is going to hit us? So usually, I mean, it, it, this, these waves tend to follow pattern. Um, it, and usually the pattern is more or less you get a peak. The peak lasts for between four and six weeks. And then you get a, this lull, which lasts for about 100 days. Mm -hmm. And how, we, how, long, how much longer do you we, think we, we still... We probably have about... Two weeks, Please. maybe even slightly less than two weeks before we reach our peak, and we will will start coming down with a number of new cases. It was a it's a very high peak that we that we're reaching now, so it might be a bit longer. But in general, that would be the sort of guesstimate, and then it will taper down to more or less where it where it was at baseline, and then usually it's about a hundred days, and then it starts picking up again. If you don't 
do something to prevent, to break the cycle, basically. And, and what's that something? At, it's vaccination. I mean, that's that's all it's going to be. Um, either leave it that we everybody gets infected by the third or the fourth wave and hope natural immunity so works. So when is that fourth wave? It's probably about, say, mid-October. Mid-October. Mid mid if, mid if we don't get vaccinated. If we don't break that, because break that I, cycle. Because I, I spoke to Dr. Theo ben yeah. and he and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. he, he gave me two st statistics. Um, fatality rate is 1.64%, um, and the um, vaccination rate at the f on the 15th of June was 0.61%. And what he was saying is that we need to vaccinate 60 to 80% of the population um, if we're going to see a difference. And if we had 0.6%, it looks like we're looking at a fourth wave, and what would the yeah. implications of that be? Well, well, the big concern is again what is exactly happening now, is that that our healthcare system gets over overwhelmed, um, that that there's no places in hospitals to treat patients. Where with the first two waves, we we had ample capacity, with the number of patients we're seeing now in private and in state and pretty much the whole country, we, we don't have that the capacity to offer the treatment. And the risk of that is that you increase mortality because you can't manage the patients which you otherwise would have been able to save. You can't save them. Um, so we, we would definitely like to prevent the fourth wave because, I mean, it's, it's, if we look at our numbers, the first wave was a few, the second wave a bit more, the third wave way more, and, and the concern is that the fourth wave would be even more, um, more putting more strain on, on, on health care, etc. Yeah. So, and, the, and the real only proven way to get out of this is to vaccinate. I mean, we can see what's happening in Europe where, where they're vaccinated. They can go back to sporting events with l less number of people but at least they can. I mean, if you look at the Euro soccer tournaments, and they're starting to get back to normal li life because their population are vaccinated, doesn't put a lot of strain on the healthcare system, yeah. um, and and even even if the vaccinated patients do get sick, they don't end up in hospital because that's ultimately what we want to do with the vaccine: is yeah. we want to prevent hospitalizations, we want to prevent death, um, and and. That's what's happening in the rest of the world, where they get to about 50 percent, 60 percent. And your target, is Theo Ben, was was right. I mean, it's herd immunity, usually between 60 and 70 percent um, of of the population. Yeah. Yeah. So, Blanche, um, yes, I'm take it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of people who have tuned in and are commending you for the initiative to have the experts to speak on. Good evening, Doctor. Uh, several questions have come in. One, first one from Hermin Swartboy, asking a question to doctor, asking what about myself suffering from severe asthma? Can I take um, a vaccine? A severe asthma? Yes. Okay. And then question from Patri Francina Patricia Lucas, uh, doctor, is the vaccine safe for people with severe allergies? That second question. Third question from Danki Gau says, does the vaccine prevent or does it cure? Explain to us the difference. Okay. And maybe the last one for now would be from Nico Grun. Doctor, if you've got to pick any vaccine, which one will be your first? Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so quite a few questions. I think the, the easy one, let's start with the asthma. Um, the, the answer is yes. Asthmatics can can be vaccinated. I would obviously speak to your um, clinician managing it at the time. Um, just we want the asthma to be more or less controlled. Um, but in general, all my asthmatics that I ma manage, I, I, I recommend for the vaccine. So I think that that's an, that's an easy question. Um, the second question, were, or the other question based on what the aim of the vaccine is, I think I, I touched on it a bit earlier, one must understand that, that a vaccine will never protect you from getting the virus. It's not like the vaccine builds a shield around you, mm. preventing the virus getting to you. It's, it's not the role of the vaccine. The role of the vaccine is to 
train your immunity to recognize the virus quicker and to kill it without overreacting. Because what's happening with the wild virus, most of our problems is the the wild being, when yeah, when you're not vaccinated. So when you when you get infected with the current, the people that end up in hospital is when their immunity overreacts to that virus. So they, for some reason, be it genetics, be it whatever, we don't know yet, those people's immune response acts differently. So what the vaccine uh, hopes to do or aims to do is to um, train your immunity to recognize this virus so that it can react to it quicker and not overreact. That's basically what it, what it, what it entails. So that if you do get the, the infection, most won't even know it. Um, and the ones, those ones won't even be able to spread it because you'll get the virus, your immunity will recognize it, it will kill it before it can settle, okay, basically. So you can't spread coronavirus if you are fully vaccinated? Well, yeah, you, you should not be able to. I mean, there's, there would be exceptions, and I'll, I'll tell about that, but in general, that would be the, that, that would be the, the, the recommendation. That if, if enough people are vaccinated, that if your immunity works, you get the virus, you get exposed to it, your, your um, immunity will sort it out before it can yeah. get hold of you. But in some people, for various reasons, they, they might still get sick. Mm. Um, but the idea then being because you, your immunity has been trained, you will not um, require hospitalization. Yeah. Because ultimately that's what we aim to do. Yeah. We aim to prevent hospitalization firstly, but secondly we aim to prevent death. Um, and, and I think that is the aim of the, of the vaccine. So Hermine who's got asthma yeah. and is, is asking the very valid question about yeah. vaccine. Between getting coronavirus and getting the vaccine, yeah. how would you balance that risk? Oh, I mean, a, a, asthmatic with, with coronavirus is a high-risk patient. Mm. So we, pre by preventing the, the virus through the vaccine or the, virus, the infection through the vaccine, vaccination, it will be way beneficial for her to get that as opposed to waiting for being infected with, with, with it. There's a follow-up question mm. from the same person on that, asking why then is remdesivir not recommended for for her? Uh, for the sorry, person suffering from the asthmatic. This is so, coronavirus no, okay. now. So, so coronavirus no, is yeah no. So remdesivir is only a treatment for a patient who is infected with coronavirus, and not even everybody. You have to have a certain laboratory parameters. There must be certain certain factors. Um, so not even everybody should get remdesivir. It's only um, there's some specific guidelines as to who should use the, who should use remdesivir, and it's not a preventative drug at all. It's not um, going to prevent you from getting the disease. It's only going to if you have the disease. It might, if you use it in the right circumstances, alter the course, helping you to recover quicker. Is there any drug that can prevent? A at the moment. Or a drug. No, nothing apart from vaccination. Mm. <laughs> That's the only only real medication we have that 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 prevents um, exposure or prevents disease. Yeah. And there are also some concerns from France and Hihangwapo. Just to, to, if, if I'm to put it in a common format, that they have a concern with taking two jabs. Why the two jabs? Yeah. Um, so c certain certain vaccines, and again, this this goes through how these vaccines have been researched. They w going into the research process. They use vaccines at different levels, at different concentrations, as a single dose, as a um, double dose, as a delayed double dose. So they test various various aspects, and that's an important thing to understand. These vaccines have gone through rigorous rigorous research. It's not a thing that has been developed in a short period of time yeah. and now suddenly given to everybody. These vaccines has gone through all the phase one, phase two and phase three clini clinical trials like all our other medication have done and they have to be proven to be effective. And what they found was in certain cases that the two, two, two vaccines that we have available, the Sinopharm and the AstraZeneca, um, there's benefit of, of it, after the second dose it becomes more effective um, and even delaying the, the second dose in AstraZeneca's t sort of case from a month to even longer improves effect efficacy. efficacy. Um, just to give you an idea in um, AstraZeneca, if, if you shorten the interval, your efficacy sits around 70, um, more or less 69, 70% um, in preventing disease, not preventing severe disease, but yeah. in preventing just disease. 
but if you delay it like like we're currently doing it improves that efficacy to in the 80 percent so yeah. yeah, yeah. so okay. that 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 would be one example the um another drug johnson and johnson their vaccine um that is a single dose vaccine it's not a double dose vaccine um and there you get your vaccine and after about 14 days you have some efficacy uh, sitting about 65 percent and after 28 days you sit with about 85 percent efficacy so these things have been researched uh, in various settings trying to determine what is the optimal optimal dose just to give you an idea there's currently in the uk there's a study um ongoing where they're looking at the efficacy of um giving two different types of vaccines okay. so giving one of the live attenuated vaccines like astrazeneca yeah. and then following it up after a period of time i think they said six weeks i'm not 100 percent sure about their protocol but after six weeks giving a mrna based um, a vaccine and they've the, the preliminary data looks like it's not been peer reviewed but at least the preliminary data looks like that is even more effective okay. than if than if you yeah so you do the one and then you do the next one and that gives you actually enhanced um, protection running into the high 90% of preventing, preventing so disease. So Sinopharm and AstraZeneca, mm. which are also two different yeah. uh, vaccines. Would I then be able to mix, have a Sinopharm and then later you, you have You would be. I mean, you can mix any vaccine. There's okay. no there's no, no limitation on how you can mix it. Um, personally, I took Sinopharm, and my plan is to take um, one of the other um, vaccines as they come available. Um, the, the the Sinopharm is a, is a dead virus. Yeah. Um, it's a coronavirus that's inactivated whereas the um, AstraZeneca vaccine is a is a um, live attenuated virus so they do uh, not a sorry not a live attenuated it's an adenovirus vector which they use so the adenovirus is a live virus but they modified its um, shell if you want to call it that to mimic that of the coronavirus um, so so two different types so theoretically you would be able to the, these two haven't been studied together that's just the only okay. sort of caveat I would have to put on on that but um, I mean, in general, about six weeks after your first vaccination, you can use whatever other vaccination you want to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Ralph Antonio is online and he is asking, why do people still contract the virus after getting vaccinated? And then there are also questions regarding the vaccine that you recommended to the first couple for them to take. So those are just some of the few questions. Yeah. So um, again, as I, as I explained, the vaccine will not protect you from being exposed to the virus. The vaccine is just there to train your immunity to react to the virus. So if you've been vaccinated and you get exposed to the virus, the virus can still come into you, but then your body will know how to respond to it. So the vaccine's aim is not to protect you from getting the virus it, it can't as i said it doesn't build a shield around you it just it just protects you from mostly getting sick from it but ultimately the aim is to protect you from needing to go to hospital and that's what that's what we want to i think it's also important to to remember other vaccines take our our influenza vaccine for instance um which we very often use yearly get your influenza mm -hmm. vaccine teachers older people younger people we recommend that to everybody most of our, our influenza vaccines are only about 50% effective in preventing disease, but they're very highly effective in preventing hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. That's why we don't see a lot of, you, 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 you can get vaccinated, you hear it a lot, but I still got flu. Yeah. But at least you didn't end up in hospital exactly. because that's what we want to prevent. We, we want to keep you alive and keep you out of hospital with, with a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Sorry, your other, there was another question. The, another one? question is on the type of vaccine recommended for the head of state and um, at, at first lady. See, see, I think it's important here to understand that um, information at that time differs from information now. Mm -hmm. um, our, our last discussion we had just before, well, at the time when, when, when I tested them, I actually recommended to the president um, to, to use the AstraZeneca vaccine at that time. And that was purely based on, on his age um, because the WHO um, has s said the Sinopharm vaccine is, is effective and safe in the age group under 60. And the over 60s, they, they weren't sure, 100% sure to, to, uh, at the time. So that was my recommendation based on, on that currently. Um, 
I would probably s recommend, well, I mean, if I look at myself, I took Sinopharm um, as, as a vaccine. I'm less than 60. Um, and I will probably, if, if we get hold of Pfizer vaccine, I will take that um, as a second follow-up um, vaccination. I might even consider taking AstraZeneca depending on some time or even the Johnson & Johnson. Uh, I mean, basically, the, all these vaccines are effective and they're safe. There's mm -hmm. really such a small... Um, the, the more we've been using it, the more we realize the, mm -hmm. the complications of these vaccines are so small and so negligible that you can pretty much take what is what is available. I don't think there's, there's a specific one that's better than the other one. I mean, mm -hmm. it's get what you can because that's ultimately the one that's that's going to work correct and, and that's really the scenario we found ourselves in because where we were talking about um there is an ideal vaccine for president it's not available in the country but what i think we must allow people to see which they've seen themselves is if i have to retrospect the risk of getting coronavirus and the risk factors related to getting coronavirus um, and the risk factors presented by the vaccine was about here. So we ended up taking a higher risk than the vaccine. Um, and mathematically, that doesn't compute. So, so that is something that people must think of, that there is a lifeline here. And you say, OK, I don't really. I'm going to use another lifeline. And this is more around me than about President, because he had real risk factors. Uh, but I, So I'm talking about myself. We, I took a higher risk than just taking a vaccine that is a lower risk. So, so certainly by the 29th of June, um, I'll be vaccinated, because I don't want to get coronavirus again, nor do I want this country to go through a fourth wave, because it's not just about saving lives, it's also about the healthcare workers, it's about the hospital resources, it's about an economy that will kill us if coronavirus doesn't. There's a lot of factors uh, to take into consideration why we all need to be committed no, in I avoiding I a fourth wave. I, I fully agree with that. And it's also not about just the individual. Yes. It's about spreading the disease and, and our fellow Namibians trying to protect them. Exactly. So I think it's, there's th this that's just very l various layers of our society that one has to has to consider, as you mentioned, economy and and healthcare and our, our society in general. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor, uh, before I go back to taking questions again, Kandali Tuleti is asking: Is the vaccine safe for HIV patients, yeah. those with a compromised immune system? Yeah. And Gina Bwedi is asking, what are the implications if one has to take the vaccine while um, he or she has the virus already? Yeah. And then just the last one from Nazari is the connection between the winter season and COVID. What yeah. is it? Okay, so let's start with the um, HIV question. Yes, you can take a vaccination if you if you. Um, if you've got HIV or living with HIV. Um, the ideal would be that you don't have any active diseases, so you should not be sick, say, with tuberculosis at the time. In that case, we would recommend first just treating the TB, for instance, that it's that it's not active anymore, and then take the vaccination. But but it's not a contraindication to take a vaccine if, you, if you're living with HIV. Um, with regards to the winter, um, the influence there, um, we we typically see in winter an increase in our respiratory diseases. So we would see more influenza. We would see... In, interesting, uh, I have seen a few cases, okay. um, more than last year. Last year, I saw none. This year, I've seen a, one or two influenza cases and one or two what we call para-influenza para cases, which is a different virus similar to, to influenza. Um, but way, 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 way less than, than previous years. Um, obviously, now coronavirus has been dominating everything we yeah. do. And as we speak currently, I mean, <laughs> numbers of patients is... is I've, I've said I've, I've become tired of writing the same script because I have to write the same thing over and over because it's all we're seeing. I mean, uh, it's we not for the last week. I haven't seen anything else basically Only apart from oh, almost a, nothing else apart yeah. from coronavirus. Blas, I'm sorry to interrupt your question uh, taking um, because you've, you've touched on something quite important. I was at the hospital today 
um, and I had to go for, I was in the radiography section, I had to go for, and I'll be pronchant, I had to go for my mammogram, and I go for a mammogram every single year. And the radiographer said to me, uh, people who were booked for this week and many last week, have, they just don't pitch. Yeah. Um, and what's the implications of this thing of everybody being scared to go to hospital mm -hmm. and they're not taking care of themselves so, if they are at risk of cancer yeah. or, or something unrelated to coronavirus? That, that was a very big concern. That is a very big concern for me still because our, our initial thought l last year, for instance, was, okay, we've got, a, we've got this coronavirus now, so let's cancel everything else. Let's cancel the elective procedures. Let's cancel the elective. And people get scared. They don't come to hospital. So they cancel. They postpone their, their, their s surgeries or their screenings, the uh, gastroscopies or the mammograms. Or, and the delay effect of that is that we, we sit with missed cancers or late diagnosis of cancers or complicated surgical procedures having to be done for things that if we were able to manage it earlier um, would, would, would um, have helped. So the, the problem is now that the hospitals are so flooded, I mean, much of our resources goes to just managing COVID where we would prefer to have still continued with as many as possible of the elective sort of semi-urgent procedures that, that needs to be done because all that this is now doing is it's just delaying our problems and making the problems worse for once this is, is over, once the COVID is over. So that, that is a big concern for me. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Brian. Just a final question. Yeah. As more viewers are tuning in from one of the late here, Natasha, asking about uh, why can't she take the vaccine if he or she has contracted the virus already? Um, uh, okay, so you, you, you can yeah, and you should, um, but you shouldn't take it while you're actively sick with it. Um, so you, you should wait till you've, you've cleared the virus. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there is different guidelines sort of some say two weeks after the virus you can but most say uh, mo two weeks after you've you've cleared the virus you can get vaccinated most say about after four weeks most guidelines so the pr pretty safe recommendation is three or uh, four weeks mm. and then any time after that you you can take the virus I, f I forgot there was a question on um, what happens if you get vaccinated while having the disease yeah. and not knowing. So, I mean, the, the vaccine, let's take Sinopharm. Sinopharm is a dead virus. So if you get vaccinated um, during, uh, say, for instance, you've got an asymptomatic infection, you're getting a dead virus now with it, it, it will really make no difference. Um, I think what also happens is, in, in the case of AstraZeneca, we see quite a few people giving, getting sort of mild side effects, and even Sinopharm as well, mm. mild side effects. So what happens is you go for the vaccine, then you start feeling, well, I'm not, I'm feeling unwell, go for the test, and then you test positive. And then people think it's a vaccine that made you test yeah. positive. It's it's not the case. Yeah, it was just... The, the yeah, sentiment. Exactly. It's it's not the vaccine. It was purely you had the virus and the timing just, just go like, sort of... Yeah, yeah. came across. The, uh, and uh, important to understand there, I mean, the AstraZeneca is not even a coronavirus. It, it, cannot, it cannot give you coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And um, the Sinopharm is a dead coronavirus. Mm -hmm. It cannot give you. Mm -hmm. And the Pfizer vaccine is a um, mRNA. It cannot give you the, the so coronavirus. So vaccines can't it, make it you can't, test positive for It corona. can't make you test positive. It's the, the test, the PCR test is... A, um, uh, RNA test, it's a genetic test, that they test for viral um, viral proteins basically, or viral RNA um, and it's, it's, it's it, it, the test doesn't differentiate between live and dead virus yeah. but it will not confuse uh, adenovirus and a coronavirus okay. it, 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 it can't do that, so it, you won't test positive because of the vaccination no. Doctor, there's a question on the after or the effects Situation Itano is asking, okay, I'm about two months post-COVID, but still mm. on and off mm. with chest pain and seldom shortness of breath. Mm. Mm. Should I go for the shot and which one? Yes. So um, you get a, a condition which is commonly known as, as long COVID. So there is where you get these ongoing sort of... Um, symptoms from COVID. In, in my case, I, I had COVID in August last year and I was severely fatigued till about end of October, beginning of November. Sort of just this 
unexplained tiredness yeah. and, and decreased drive and just not wanting to get out of bed, basically. Um, and, and, and fortunately, that, that subsided. So you do get patients who suffer with longer-term term complications. Some people lose their smell, for instance, for a longer period of time. Some people continue with shortness of breath. I think in, in that case, yes, you can get a vaccine. I would probably recommend that you first consult your healthcare professional, that they just do a thorough examination, just making sure it is actually just the, the, the sort of long lasting effects of the COVID and that it's not something else. But if, if apart from that you're healthy, then get the vaccine. And again, which vaccine? Pretty much any vaccine which is available. Um, there are some, as I said, alluded to earlier, some recommendations as to age groups, et cetera, et cetera, and some underlying health conditions, but they, that the individual will have to speak to their mm. health care provider for. And my last question, doctor, before we, you continue with the discussion is from Tosi, asking, can one mix vaccines like one shot of AstraZeneca and then Pfizer as the second yeah. shot? Yeah. So, as I, as I explained today, the, the, the studies are currently ongoing. Um, at the moment, the recommendation is not to get, say, one shot AstraZeneca, one shot Sinopharm, one shot Pfizer. One, that, that would not be the idea. The idea would be to, um, and, and listen, th this might also change because there are studies looking at that, but currently as we speak, um, the idea would be to, say, take Sinopharm and finish it, and then if you want to wait six weeks and or more, and then take AstraZeneca or Pfizer or whichever other vaccine is available. That would be the best way to, to um, mix the, the, the vaccines currently with the current available evidence. Yeah. All right, then. So do keep uh, sending your questions to Dr. Brewer or to the First Lady on this topic, the consultations or the discussions that is continue. So one of the things that we spoke about um, was I was... I was telling uh, Dr. Brouvet that there were nights I would wake up and it felt like I was woken up by adrenaline, which it, it was probably just anxiety. Um, and does anxiety, depression have an impact on how you recover or handle coronavirus? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, I, th I think it's probably going to be one of our lasting, the lasting effects um, in, in um, our healthcare system is going to be the psychiatric lasting effects, uh, the PTSD, just generalized anxiety, those type of things. Because many patients, um, so, I mean, I, I had the same. I mean, you, you're suddenly confronted with a disease where you realize having, you're having to confront your own mortality yeah. um, because, you, I mean, you, that's all you see. Um, I think the important aspect there is to realize it is not all it is, um, but, but it, you know, the, the emotional and the, the, the um, psychosocial impact of it is, is tremendous. I mean, looking at, I've, I've got a major concern with patients currently in, in ICU, or not currently, from when we had the pandemic, because we, we, we isolating the patient. Yeah. We can't get the families to see the patients. Mm -hmm. The patients are by themselves. Yeah. And, and two things happen. One is they unfortunately don't survive. And then the family sits with this emotional scar of what happened to my loved one. I couldn't see, I couldn't go through the process with them. Or they survive, they're, fortunate, they're the fortunate ones that survive, but there the patient sits with a scar because he's been in the ICU where death occur, um, where they isolated, they see people fully protected mm -hmm. coming to them, not, having, not the, having the ability to even see a smile or facial expression for weeks on end. I mean, uh, I think the, the emotional scars we're going to have with, with this is going to be a tremendous problem for us going forward in the years to come. Yeah. What, what I felt, um, even before, even with my parents and even when I got it, it was just this overwhelming sense of powerlessness. And it almost makes you angry. It almost, it, 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 it makes you so angry yeah. because you're so powerless. You've got no idea. But, but maybe let's go back to that because given the amount of people who actually contract coronavirus and the number of people who pass away, yeah. um, all of us, immediately think, am I going to die? Which is a rational idea, but what do the statistics bear our fear yeah, out? It's, it's, it's minute, very, very small 
percentage of patients. I mean, the numbers is 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 large numbers compared to other diseases, but percentage-wise, your chances of survival is very high. It's close to 98, 99%, yeah. depending on. So by, by, by far, the most people getting it will get a mild infection, might not even know it. That's the biggest population of it. A smaller percentage will end up in hospital, a smaller percentage will end up in, in ICU, and yeah. then a very small percentage will, will end up passing away from it. So your chances are way better of surviving it yeah. um, than, than yeah. not. And that's kind of how I dealt with my yeah. anxiety. Yeah. Where I say to myself, every day I'm hearing somebody is dying, but the, that's 1.64%. Yeah. And I want to believe yeah. that I'm in the 98% exactly. that is going to make yeah. it. Yeah. So I thought, why would I not be in the 98%? Yeah. And, and looking at that 98% yeah. number and the amount of people who are actually recovering, yeah. and not the people who tragically lose yeah. um, their lives. Yeah. Because it's as if we're focusing all our attention and anxiety yeah on 1.64% mm. and we're ignoring the fact that 98.4% mm. are actually making it through. Yeah, I, I think that's an important aspect. One must just, uh, the, 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 it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to, to, to sort of think about because yes, it is minute numbers that don't. So the, patient, for the, the risk for the patient getting infected with COVID is very small, okay. Unfortunately, in the pandemic, the numbers of death I I is high because, I mean, if we, the more people we get infected, the more we'll fall into that small, small percentage. And that's what we're seeing with the numbers rising, how many cases, 30 plus cases a day passing away. And, and that's still the reason why we want to vaccinate, despite the individual risk being low, but the society risk increases because if we're going to lose one or two percent of our whole Namibian population, it's going to be massive numbers. And that's, that's, what we, that's what, why we're still pushing the, the vaccination um, th uh, as opposed to just letting the virus. And that's what we were trying to say yesterday on yeah. social media. The only way we bring the deaths down yeah. is if we bring the infection rate down. Absolutely. Because that percentage plays yeah. together with the infection. Yeah. Exactly. And we only have this high number of deaths because so many people contracted the yeah, coronavirus. Exactly. I mean, that's, ex that's absolutely right. Because that so small percentage actually yeah. die from it, but the numbers just make that small percentage yeah. such, such high numbers. But the strange thing is many people asked us, how did you make it through? Um, and the first day, because it's true, many people prayed for us and we prayed so much. And I said, we prayed a lot. But by the second day, I realized, but you're being so insensitive. Yeah. Are you saying other people who passed away didn't pray? Did they do something wrong? Yeah. And the answer is no. Yeah. There is no cure. And, 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 and coronavirus is like Russian roulette. We don't know who is exactly. going to be part yeah. of that 1.64%. There are people with a higher probability, but we don't know yeah. who that is. And you, you've, you're absolutely right. And as a, as a clinician managing patients with COVID, it, it's one of my most frustrating aspects of medicine is usually I know I can treat certain things yeah. and you've got a very good chance of, of success. But in, in this disease, you're, you're, it's, it's almost you want to call it lush, Russian roulette. You'll do the same to two diff, to similar patients and the one will make it and the other one won't. And, you, you, and there's, you, no there's no explanation for it. I mean, we, we, we talk about risk factors. I mean, we, we mentioned it, you mentioned it earlier as well. We, we, we think certain people are at higher risk because they overweight or they're old or they have got diabetes or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call the risk factor. But then you also get the very young, healthy, fit person and that person also doesn't make it. And you cannot explain what is a different, wh why in this yeah. case and why not we in this case. We see more of those young, healthy, fit patients passing away now mm -hmm. than in the second wave. Yeah, we, we're definitely seeing younger people ending up in the ICU, yes. ICU. Um, de de definitely more. Um, my, and again, personal experience, <laughs> you can never really mm -hmm. say if there was any, anything about it. But in uh, just the sort of very old 80 plus people in the first wave, we had a f many of them, and they sort of did well in the ICUs, remarkably to me, um, I th which was not the case in the rest of the world. I don't know yeah. why, but and, and at that stage, I was sort of 55 to, say, 75. That group didn't, didn't do th that well, and the younger group did better. But now we're sort of seeing 40-year-olds and 30-year-olds getting 
very, very sick and ending up in ICUs, and some of them actually not, not surviving. And that, that we, you can't explain it. I mean, it could be changes in the virus. It could just be a chance effect. We, we, you, you just don't know what it is. Maybe the, the younger population is now being infected more, so the numbers are more. That's why we're seeing it. I, you, I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's just an observation that we that I've been seeing in the in the hospital where I work. So. Yeah. Doctor, quite a number of questions again. Isabella wants to know, can a pregnant woman or the one breastfeeding get vaccinated? Question one. And then Angel Tommy is asking, is there a national database to verify if a person was vaccinated before or not? Or how do you verify if a person was vaccinated in case one turns up claiming that they have lost the vaccination card. And Seona is asking Dr. Brewer, can you explain why population immunity from vaccines is a speedier option for Namibia than it is to wait for herd immunity to determine? What is the difference? Okay. So um, I think you're going to have to remind me about some of them, but I'll, we'll go through them. I think they're all, all, all important aspects. So with the question around breastfeeding and, um, and pregnancy, um, th you'll have to ask your, the gynecologist managing your, your pregnancy. I know um, it ha there are some studies now that it is safe in pregnancy and it can be used, but again, the recommendation would be to first consult your gynecologist or the doctor managing you, because again, it will. It's not a, a blanket. Yes, everybody should. Every pregnant lady can be vaccinated, but yes, um, and in breastfeeding, yes, they can. Why we can say that is there are many um, patients that ended up during the trials of these these vaccines ended up becoming pregnant during or after the vaccination, and then we saw. Okay, listen, it's actually quite safe. So, and then they sort of pulled back and said, okay, let's see what happens. So there are some small studies being done in pregnant patients. So there are the recommendations are coming out that, that pregnant ladies can be vaccinated. But again, rather speak to your, your gynecologist. I'm not a gynecologist um, in, in that case. Um, with regards to the question of um, why not let the herd immunity um, just let, let the virus go its natural course and lead to herd, herd immunity. So you've 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 got two two problems there. The one is um, we mentioned the the impact it will have on our society. I mean the the amount of death we'll have allowing this virus to to spread because the more people get infected, the more death we will have, okay. even if it is even if, if it is a small number. And so we want to prevent that from happening um, by using the vaccine. But also this, the second thing is that natural immunity does not necessarily give you lasting protection. That's what that's what we mentioned um, with this three month period. So we know pretty sh with pretty good certainty that you have immunity for at least three months mm -hmm. and most probably for at least eight months. After that, we cannot we cannot guarantee that you have immunity. There is um, sort of immune memory that probably will play a role, but we don't know about the robustness of that and we can't, can't test for that immune memory after that eight month period, if you want to call it that. And what is of concern is also we have been seeing cases who've been coming back with a second infection. Um, and we've actually last week, uh, maybe the week before last, I lost my first patient who came back with a second infection. So even that does not necessarily what protect you. She was actually about three months, just more than three, three months. months. Yeah, wow. yeah. She had it sort of at the end of January, beginning of February in that time. I don't know exactly the, oh, wow. this year. And then now again. You know, so it that that's a problem with natural immunity. We It does not give you a guarantee. Viral uh, Im vaccination immunity also doesn't give you a guarantee, but at least it improves the chances. And the, that's why we're advocating for, for more vaccinations. So. That's quite frightening. And that yeah. really motivates me to get yeah. to vaccinated, even though I've had coronavirus and I've got antibodies, yeah. um, as soon as it's safe to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, if I've got one question, doctor, just uh, sent by Angel Tommy asking, how can one verify that a person was vaccinated in case he or she turns up 
and claim that they lost the vaccination okay. card. So, so again, I, I, about the administration thereof, I, I, I don't know. Just in my personal experience, I went for my vaccination, the first vaccination at Vintuk Central Hospital, and then I thought I'm going to take a shortcut and I'm going to go for my second follow-up vaccination at at, um, at Katatura Hospital. Um, and I got to Katatura and I was sitting there and after 20 minutes, I gave in my card, I, you get the vaccine card, I gave in my card. After 20 minutes, I'm sitting, no, nothing is happening. So I'm walking in and looking and there they're paging through the, the registry and saying, okay, but I haven't been vaccinated there. So I said, oh, no, I wasn't there. I was at Vintage Central. So there is actually record kept of the patients who are vaccinated and it gets saved. So in my case, I know it, <laughs> it happened like that. And I suppose if you lose your vaccine card, the records will be there and you could go back and say, I was vaccinated on this day at this place and they would be able to access that information. Can I understand something? It's not electronically stored. It's well, manually stored, so you must go back to the place where you yeah, were vaccinated. Listen, I, I, I don't know. I think there is an electronic database. I was okay. from the. I was in the first sort of group, so okay. at that stage it was manually. I don't know. Maybe it's electronic now. I, I, I am we're not. We're going to have it. a discussion at eight o'clock on Clubhouse, and we'll have somebody from the Ministry of Health, and we'll ask yeah. him the question yeah. about how it's being managed. Just before I hand back the discussion, Madam First Lady, Doctor, there's a common question around steaming yeah. here. Yeah, it, it, the, I, I think the long and the short, or well, the easy on, uh, answer there is doesn't really make a difference. Um, the, the possible benefit of steaming is that when you get coronavirus, one of the effects of the coronavirus is that it thickens your mucus, your secretions quite a lot. And just by steaming, it might loosen the secretions a bit and get you to clear it a bit easier. But it won't. The, the initial thought was increasing the temperature will kill the virus and protect you. But it, it, it makes no difference. At temperatures where you would really kill the virus, you'll burn yourself. So that's definitely not recommended. Have you treated patients who've burnt themselves? No, no, fortunately not. And what about this thing where we're putting anaconda and peppermint oil and tea tree yeah. oil and eucalyptus oil? Yeah, as a, as a pulmonologist, I'm usually scared of those things because you get allergic reactions in the lungs oh. to, to many of these things. Um, not everybody. Again, it's not like everybody will get it, but we do see these. I mean, in general, they're safe, but but there are exceptions where you get what we call hypersensitivity reactions in the lungs. So if I do steam, I should rather not use yeah, anything? Yeah, rather just use either medication, there is some, or just sterile water if you can. Sterile yeah. water. Okay. Yeah. Just a last question. How, why is it that some people in the same house, if one test positive, the other, especially partners, yeah. the other would be negative yeah. in that case? Yeah. Um, again, one of the it's it's one of the things we don't fully understand about this this virus because um, uh, it has to it will have to do with genetics, susceptibility, viral load in, in the house, the household's own ways of protecting themselves, hand washing, general hygiene, those type of things. In my in my personal experience, my <laughs> in my case, um, again I was sort of got the COVID early on in the in the pandemic and at the, I was one of the first that was allowed to self isolate at home before me the many people had to isolate at specific designated facilities um, and I the 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 Monday evening I tested positive the Tuesday even of the Tuesday morning the Monday evening it was soccer um, I watched soccer with my two younger kids um, they were lying on top of me giving me kisses I was sort of telling them though they must stop because I'm working with COVID patients they must just sort of just be around me but not too close to me and then the next day I get to work and I heard the nurse that I work with tested positive yeah. so I went for the test and I'm positive three days four days later I get I get started getting symptoms um, and my wife tested we tested my wife because we're in the same household she is negative so I, I self isolated um, and then after my 10 days or whatever um, I think at that time it was still 14 days but after 10 days we tested my wife again and then she ended up positive and my eldest son being tested positive but the younger two that pretty much spent the most time with me, they didn't test positive. I, I, I just didn't, couldn't believe it. So I tested them and tested them and tested them. Yeah. And they just remained negative. So it's, you, you can't, we can't explain it because we don't know everything about the I virus yet. Experience. Um, yeah. My parents, I went to spend the whole Saturday with them. Um, and I'm the one who took them to Pathcare to um, get
the same color. There was a young lady who served me. I ate. I spent the whole day with my parents. Um, and then we get their test back after eight hours, and I've been with them the whole day. They're positive. So I assumed I must be positive because everybody else tested positive, and I didn't. So that was quite interesting. No. And then just another thing, Blanche, that I want to ask Dr. Brevet, is you said to us, we don't have to have a second test because after 10 or 14 days, um, yeah, what so, was that about? Yeah, so initially the, uh, the, the recommendations was that you, um, that you test, you get your first positive test, and then after, say, 10 days, or I think initially it was still 14 days, you do a, a repeat test to see if the virus is still around. And that was what we used to de-isolate patients at the time. Mm -hmm. But then, I don't know if you might recall our first index cases, they tested positive for 80 plus 90 days, I don't know exactly. Yeah, kept yeah, we kept them in isolation because, but as we learned more about the virus, we realized, as I said earlier, the, the test doesn't differentiate between live and dead virus. Mm. So the dead virus material might stay there for many, many months. So it's actually pointless to test after 10 days or 14 days because... because you're testing positive, but you're not contagious. You're not contagious, yeah. So we know that you, if you're asymptomatic by day 10, you're no longer contagious and you can de-isolate. And that's why the protocols change that we don't have to test um, at, at, at because it makes no no sense because we the test won't add anything to our our, our management. Yeah. No. And um, Erwin Tapopi wants to know the duration of the vaccine or the first shot before it strengthens the immune system yeah. to help fight the virus. Yeah. So in um, the the case of the two vaccines we have here. The, it, the effect will be very minimal after the first dose. And that's why we're seeing patients getting effect or well, getting disease and uh, they were after one dose. You, the, the vaccine you have to see as a totality. You need the two doses for it to be effective. So I, I, I have a problem with media reporting a single dose vaccination as a patient being vaccinated. It's not. The, you need both doses to be vaccinated. Otherwise, it makes no difference. The Johnson & Johnson is different. So the Johnson & Johnson, which is a single dose vaccine, um, there you start having your first benefit after 14 days and full benefit after 28 days. So, um, but again, that vaccine is developed to be a single dose vaccine. The others, you have to see the two shots as one vaccination, and it's only once you've completed the full vaccination, then it starts being effective after about two weeks. No. And Stanley Isak wants to know what the type of desperin you recommended for the first couple. I think it was Ecotrin. It, it, it's Ecotrin. It's, okay. it's a plain aspirin. It's uh, 81 milligrams of aspirin, Ecotrin, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, First, Madam First Lady, Girly Sam is questioning the effectiveness of the vaccine campaign, asking how can it, uh, the vaccines or the, how the vaccines work, can that not be translated in local languages? So that's a, a Ministry of Health question. Um, but I also, and I'll never speak for the Ministry of Health. I don't think Dr. Brevet would speak for the Ministry of Health either. But I do certainly agree that we do need to be inclusive in this vaccination campaign. I agree with Gurley. Um, but I'm also looking at if we can't, on our own, find people from the Ministry of Health, translate certain documentation ourselves and disseminate it. Because when in times of pandemic, what I'm assuming without any information is that people at the Ministry of Health are overwhelmed. And there's a lot of information on vaccine. And there's nothing stopping credible people like Dr. Brevet or people with resources or access like myself to take that information, go to Afrikaans radio, go to uh, uh, Damara Nama radio, go to Oshiro radio, um, or, and to all the other language groups and, and, and have somebody who speaks the language and have this discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I really respect organizations like IPPR, I know F and B Trusco came out today. There's a lot of private sector organisation NGOs who are getting involved in giving credible information to people, um, and I really encourage people with platforms 
to consult the experts, bring the experts onto their platforms in different languages, go to radio, give the right information. Because Blanche, there's also people who I believe are influential, people who I believe are intelligent, who are spreading misinformation. I, I, I know so many business people, I know even doctors, who some of their views, when you see them, you wonder, wow, what's going on here? Um, and, and I think we all have a responsibility to each other to spread the right information, but not to go there, me as Monica again, because what do I know um, about medicine and vaccines? I must bring people like Dr. Bruvet to speak about things that he knows and has studied and continuously studies, because what I know might be three months old, which has changed, because one point that he kept on making, the information is changing all the time. We kept people in this country for three months, um, we wouldn't do it today. Um, the recommendation that president got, for instance, on the ideal vaccine for him has changed. So now he's being recommended a different vaccine. So information is changing, and only the experts are on a daily basis studying this information. Mm -hmm. so, doctor, there's a question for you from Nandesora Chikua asking what's the effect of blood clots in the lungs and COVID, the connection there? Okay, um, so COVID is a is a blood vessel disease in general. It affects pretty much all of our blood vessels. It can affect, um, and it increases coagulability, so it makes you clot easier and forming blood clots easier. So we we see um, a lot of patients that actually develop blood clots into their lungs, um, and the problem there is you get then two. If it happens with the coronavirus, you get two um, dis disorders both affecting the lungs and both affect affecting oxygen trans transport at the same time and therefore making it um, more, well, increasing the patient's risk, basically. So, um, and the second thing that happens, which, which we're now seeing quite a lot of, is the patients developing um, blood clots after the after the COVID acute COVID infection, so they'll start recovering from the COVID, go home, even from hospital, go home, and then four or five days later, suddenly start becoming short of breath again, more more exercise intolerant and stuff, and then we go and look and we find the blood clot. So even there's this delay in the development of these blood clots. So our recommendation is usually to take the anticoagulants, the blood thinners, for a bit longer than well, just the longer. up to a month, more or less, month. up to a month. Yeah. Yeah. And when I go for vaccine, and so two questions from me quickly. Yeah. The risk of uh, clotting yeah. relative to a vaccine, because we're reading a lot about AstraZeneca yeah. and clotting, yeah. and the risk of clotting with COVID, which one is higher? Oh, the COVID is way higher. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the risk of clotting in in um, uh, the the vaccines is one in a million type of numbers, where in, in COVID it's, it's way, way higher. Um, the uh, sorry, and the, the, the and in the second one was, if I go just for vaccine, I don't yeah. have COVID, yeah, yeah. and I've never had oh, COVID. Yeah. I'm just going for vaccine, yeah. and there is this one in a million chance of yeah. of, of clotting. Should I take? take a, uh, anti so in, in the 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 general answer is no, because what we we always always have to look at numbers needed to treat. So yeah. if I give a million people an anticoagulant to prevent a, the one clot, I will probably give more of them complications from the anticoagulant, gastric bleeding, those type of things. If So, so the, those numbers needed to treat. Are, that doesn't say everybody, that holds true for everybody. So some people are at high risk for developing clots. In their case, I would recommend an, an using an a, a additional anticoagulant. I would definitely not recommend using an anticoagulant to everybody going for the vaccination because we'll have more problems from the anticoagulant then. Doctor, there's a rather personal question here from Nulena Isabella, who wants to know what did you treat yourself with when you had COVID? I think that's actually a good question <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, I'm pretty much the same <laughs> that 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 we I, I did not um, I we I was fortunate not not requiring remdesivir at the time it was I I tried to get remdesivir it wasn't available in the country um, and but we we managed but then I didn't need it um, fortunately um, the second um, th was just plain anticoagulant and then an antibiotic mm -hmm. similar antibiotic. 
I was actually offered ivermectin at the time by by a, f um, a colleague, um, but I decided looking uh, at the time I didn't know much about ivermectin, but I read up about it and realized it's not going to make a difference, so I didn't use it. Um, and yeah, that was it. Yeah. Um, and, and and maybe I should also just add there what um, our, our full we, we were on immune boosters um, yeah, yeah. on Ecotrin, on the Remdesivir. Yeah the antibiotic, yeah. and then there was that one that said gout. What was that for? Oh, the colchicine, yeah. That, uh, that I didn't use. Uh, the, so there's, there's not, uh, reasonably recently there came a study out that's called the Colrona study, which, where it showed that in outpatients, if you give um, the, the, the gout medication to, to people, the, it helps to prevent hospitalizations. Um, so it's it, uh, again, numbers needed to treat is quite low, uh, quite high, so you need to treat a lot of patients to, to get that benefit from it. But it's a reasonably safe drug with few side effects, so um, we sometimes recommend that to use. I didn't use that because at the time, again, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't part of it. That specific gout tablet has also got an um, anti-inflammatory, uh, it's gout is an inflammatory condition, so it's got some anti-inflammatory effects as well, so it... it um, helps to prevent inflammation and that's ultimately why we why we do these things um, one thing that that uh, I didn't use and we didn't need to use in in um, you as well was the steroids mm. some people will get steroids um, but there's certain again criteria for using steroids and who should benefit from it and who should use it and who shouldn't use mm -hmm. it um, and ag again you can't generalize that to everybody um, yeah. and I think that's the main message here that everybody's treatment regime differs. Yeah. And just because the gout thing worked there or remdesivir yeah. worked it here, it doesn't mean it's going to work Absolutely. with you. Absolutely. So we mustn't uh, go all running out trying to find remdesivir yeah. or all run out going, trying to find gout. But what would be a generalized recommendation that is going to work for most people? Vitamins, healthy diet. Which vitamins? Vitamin, vitamin C um, plays a role. Vitamin D we give. It is a bit controversial. There's, we initially gave very high doses of vitamin D. Then we, the study sort of said, no, high doses of vitamin D doesn't, do, doesn't make a difference. So we scaled back to sort of normal doses of vitamin D. Um, zinc plays a role in immunity. So a combination. So some multivitamin with vitamin C, vitamin D, and, and zinc in it is usually usually a part of it, and then symptomatic treatment, paracetamol for fever and those type of things. Okay. Um, and the um, ecotrin, the, the, yeah, the blood thinner, that's the, blood the, thinner. the aspirin. That would um, be a generalized, that's, pretty that's recommended much for most st people. Start generalized treatment, okay. because we want to prevent those clots. Um, yeah. okay. There's a question from Maria Magdalena Indongo asking, can blood thinners be at the pharmacy without prescription? And then Lumbo asking about the hydroxychloroquine. Okay, so um, that that specific ecotrin desperin can be bought uh, over the counter without a prescription. Yes, there are other stronger blood thinners that you can't buy that you need a prescription. But that's not what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. We're talking about purely by, by with aspirin, and that is uh, is available. Um, the the hydroxychloroquine, as I mentioned. Initially, in the in the discussion, was a um, a drug um, that we use for rheumatoid conditions that was found in the lab to um, ha have potential sort of curing effect or killing effect on the virus, but it ended up not being helpful at all in in um, in the actual treatment of the patients. And in fact, there's actually some evidence that it increased risk for patients, mm -hmm. specifically related to drug interactions with with um, re relation to the heart, arrhythmias, etc., like that. I remember President yeah. Trump saying yeah. that he drank hydrochloroquine, but yeah. then when he got coronavirus, he got remdesivir. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, th that's the thing. I mean, I think we, we have to understand that information will come, mm -hmm. um, and some information might initially look good at the onset, but with time we learn that less and it, it doesn't make a difference. Or we learn that yes, it makes a difference. I yeah. mean, we, 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 those things can, uh, things can change. Um, and at the time, I mean, I remember my rheumatoid patients running out of their medication, starting to have flare-ups of their disease because they couldn't buy it. Everybody else went <laughs> buying it. And I, I think pretty much the same thing is happening with ivermectin now. Hopefully our, our um, farmers won't run out of medicine, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I think they're drinking it themselves yeah. at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Doctor, Desma Corporation wants to know, is it recommended to self-medicate with antibiotics of broad spectrum whenever I feel certain or experience certain symptoms? No, please not. Um, I think antibiotics is, is medication that you need to get with a prescription, and I would definitely be, consult a doctor before taking antibiotics for various reasons. One of the reasons being, firstly, you don't want to take an antibiotic if there's no indication, but also drug sort of um, drug, bug resistance and drug resistance. We, we, we really don't recommend people just using antibiotics for the sort of because they feel this or they feel that. Very often antibiotics, antibiotics has got a very specific role. It's a, it's a antibacterial so it only works for bacteria. It doesn't work for viruses. So if you've got a viral infection, in general, the, the rule of thumb is antibiotics makes no difference. There are some exceptions. Um, some, except, some antibiotics we use with anti-inflammatory effects, et cetera, et cetera. But in general, consult your doctor before taking antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are about to round off uh, the discussion between the First Lady and Dr. Brewer, but uh, just the last one is from Nico, asking about the long-term effects of um, the vaccine. And I think, Doctor, after that, you can uh, give your concluding remarks and as well as the First Lady. I actually just want him to finish <laughs> and conclude. I think his <laughs> views are more important yeah. than mine. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, I think the, the, the long-term effects, one has to understand from, from what happens with a vaccine to understand what the long-term effects will be. Vaccine, like any foreign body, when it, when it gets taken up in, into the body structures, um, certain things happen. There's certain cells that we call scavenger cells. They're there to take up viruses or vaccines or whatever else is there. And these scavenger cells are programmed to... Um, to destroy things. So they process it, they show it to the body's immune system, and then they destroy it, and they, they get rid of it, they clear it from the body. So the vaccine will, will come into the body, it will be worked, worked with these cells, it will be presented to your, your immune cells, and your immune cells will learn from it, but then the vaccine will be, will be destroyed. And from experience, we know that long-term effects of that is highly unlikely to have any lasting effects. I mean, we've been doing vaccine development for many, many, many years, and we, we, we know what works. There are some newer vaccines on the market, like the, the Pfizer um, RNA vaccines, but uh, mRNA vaccines. But uh, again, the, the, the body's processes are known to us, so we know how the body deals with things, and we know that the long-term effects would be, um, would be highly unlikely to develop. Um, um, and in the case of, for instance, a Sinopharm, it's a pure dead virus. So, if I can squeeze in one last question. You, you're a specialist. Coming in, it's like oh, it? as I've started. <laughs> <laughs> you're, a specialized, you're a specialist physician. Yeah. How does a person have access to you? Um, well, <laughs> I'm busy at the moment, <laughs> but <laughs> in general, in general, through through referral, or I mean, you don't have to have a referral to come and see me. Um, you can make an appointment through my through my office. Um, most of the general physicians like work like that, and even sort of, I'm always available for consultations. So if your doctor has a question, um, I mean, I get calls from Ongodiva, Rundu, pretty much Mariental, Oranjemund. Walfus Bay, Hubavus, pretty much everywhere. Um, doctors will phone me saying they've got a patient, the patient can't necessarily travel, but I'm always available to advise. So the, the doctors, the, the patient can see their doctor, their doctor can speak to me or can refer to me or um, whichever way is easiest for them. Okay. So, doctor, in your concluding remarks, and I think the First Lady can also share the view here, is it, can one say that as consumers, with so much information available about the vaccines, are we then caught up in a war among the manufacturers, manufacturers of the vaccines? Yeah. So, the, the marketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, the, there's definitely, obviously, the the the, the vax. Vaccine developing companies, they, there's obviously a financial incentive for them to um, to yeah to sp get their product on the market. Um, but I also think that many of them have realised that 
this is a worldwide pandemic and they have to share their their expertise and so what what we're getting is AstraZeneca being developed for instance at Oxford University giving their patents away for uh, other companies to make so that it can be di dis distributed over the world so I think um, there's a risk but we are seeing a lot of co collaboration between the between the companies um, there are some where we think the story about for instance the the spread of the information with regards to AstraZeneca and the clot formation mm -hmm. that that because it's so small numbers it shouldn't really be a, an, issue. an issue but because of this sort of maybe competition that was blown out of proportion and now we sit with the complications of that people believing it's a major major problem and it not being that big a problem but in general i think the the most of the companies have been very helpful in spreading information and availability to vaccination to countries like us and other african countries um, resource limited countries where we can't develop our own own vaccines mm -hmm. madam gengos you have a minute to close up I think there we have it. I think each one of us are different. Each one of us uh, believe different things. But I think each one of us has an obligation to the other person. We, we need to be kinder to each other. Um, because everybody's dealing with something at the moment. I have anxiety at the moment, which I've never had. Um, and trying to be kinder to people. Um, we must vaccinate. Uh, don't be like me. We... Up with a big risk. We must vaccinate. Um, I will, I must vaccinate, um, not only because I don't want to pass it on to anybody else, I don't want to get COVID ever again. It's, it's not a nice experience. I don't recommend it to anybody. Um, so I think let's vaccinate. Well, the First Lady indicated that she will be having this type of discussions where she will bring in experts to dissect some of your questions and provide answers. So from us here at State House, good night. <laughs>